everyone and welcome back to my channel. This is Fiona at Drawings in a Drawer and this is a new video from my art and crime series talking about Italian crimes and mysteries while I paint a picture of one of the protagonists of the story. So grab yourself a cup of coffee or a glass of wine and get ready to dive into today's case. The Terrible Night of the Circeo Murder, a story we might never have found out about hadn't it been for the bravery of one young woman, the woman who I'm going to be painting today, Donatella Colasanti. I've personally grown up knowing the story of this crime, though it happened before I was born, partially because I used to have a seaside home not far from where this happened, literally 20 minutes away in the car, so I knew the location of this murder very well. In a way, it was almost like the story of the bogeyman, as these two girls had done nothing to get into trouble. They were normal teenagers who thought they were going to a party with a couple of nice, well-mannered, polite boys who came from well-to-do families. I think they almost look like Prince Charmings to them. But now let's go back to the beginning of the story before I start rambling. As has been the case with the previous crimes I told you about, this story also starts in Rome. It's the 25th of September 1975. Donatella Colasanti is 17 years old and lives in the district of Montagnola, which at the time was considered to be a working class area. Not a bad area, just an area where people with less money or lower wages lived. Sometimes people who had emigrated from the poorer southern regions or from outside the city. I personally don't know this area very well, but I'm assuming that since the 70s, things will have changed a lot as they usually do. So I'm telling you what it was like then, kind of to put a frame around the portrait of Donatella, to imagine where she came from and what her life was like. It's very important for this story to see that. Together with her friend Nadia, Donatella goes to meet a friend at the Café Il Fungo, which means mushroom. You can tell why it's called that. And this friend introduces them to a boy who says his name is Carlo. Actually, his name is Giampiero Parboni Arquati, and he belongs to an upper class family living in the posh district of Parioli, which we talked about in the previous episode. The three of them get chatting and decide to meet up again two days later on September the 27th. For some reason, though, at the last minute, Nadia decides not to go, a decision which most likely saved her life. However, Donatella is still extremely keen and she asks another friend to join her. This friend says yes. Her name is Rosaria Lopez and she's two years older than Donatella, making her 19. The two girls are excited as they head off to meet up with a supposed Carlo. There are two other guys with them. Their names are Angelo Izzo and Gianni Guido. The boys, again, don't tell the girls their real names. They're all from the same posh district. Two of them are already at university studying medicine and architecture. Soon they start talking about a party they're going to have the following Monday, September the 29th. They tell the girls that they should join them. They are friends now, right? These young lads are so charming and kind. The girls accept. The small group decides to meet up in front of the cinema theatre Ambassade, not far from where Donatella and Rosaria live. At 4.30 in the afternoon on September the 29th, the boys shop in a white Fiat 127. However, only Angelo and Gianni are in the car. Giampiero, the one who had given the name Carlo and was the first guy they had met, was not with them. Angelo and Gianni say that he is waiting for them at the villa where the party is being held, a villa south of Rome, not too far from the city, on the coastal town of Lavigno. It's possibly a little further than the girls were expecting to go, but it's only an hour's drive, not much longer than it would take to cross the city during rush hour. And anyway, the boys promise they'll take the girls home before dark, and Donatella and Rosaria are too stoked now to give up on their plans, so they get into the car after the briefest hesitation, happy and excited about what they are sure it's going to be a fun night. After a while though, they realise it's taking longer than it should to reach Lavinio. Yes, one of the boys explains, actually it's not exactly Lavinio they're going to, just a little further and they're almost there anyway. At one point they stop the car so Angelo can make a phone call to their other friend, or so he says. The truth is he is calling someone else, a young man who has not yet appeared on the scene. His name is Andrea Ghira, and he owns a villa on the peninsula of San Felice Circeo, a place where they often hang out with friends or girls. He tells Andrea that he is taking the girls to the villa. The villa, which is called Villa Moresca, is a beautiful three-storey building with whitewashed walls and exquisite furnishings set amidst the lush Mediterranean vegetation with a sparkly sea only minutes away. There is nobody there yet, though. 
The other guests will arrive soon, Angela and Janney reassure the girls, getting them to sit down in the living room and have a chat while they listen to music and have a drink. Donatella and Rosaria have no idea of the nightmare that awaits them. These boys from well-to-do families living in the district of Parioli are perfectly kind and have the best of intentions, right? No. Coming from the district of Parioli in those days, and especially if you were in your late teens or early 20s, could mean something else too. It could mean being involved in politics, being a fascist, taking philosopher Nietzsche's concept of the superhuman and transforming it into something evil and twisted. These guys felt superior because of their social status, because of their money. Angelo Izzo had already been convicted of rape the previous year, and two years before, together with Andrea Ghira, he had committed and been convicted of robbery. So it's no surprise these gentlemen were giving out false names. They were spoilt, violent, arrogant, and also, possibly as a result of these traits, extremely stupid, as it will turn out later on. There is so much one could say about people, men, if they can even be called that, like these. Unfortunately, this kind of human being is far from being wiped out. Men with the assumption they can get away with anything, and that women, as we so often see, are mere objects to be used and cast aside like rag dolls. In this case, the situation is taken to the worst possible scenario, and you'll see how they take it for granted that they can get away with it, how they feel it means absolutely nothing. It's not long before things begin to escalate, to feel tense. The first boy they had originally met, the one who they felt they knew the most and who had given the name Carlo, is nowhere to be seen, and it's quite clear there are no other guests who are going to join them tonight. There is no party. The boys start to pester the girls. They want to get physically close to them and the girls don't feel comfortable. That's not why they came here. And even if they might have had romance in their minds at one point, it would certainly not have happened this fast. This was the 70s in a Catholic country, so you can imagine things were very different to what they are today. However, the image of the handsome boy dressed in designer clothes and with perfect manners crumbles very rapidly to be replaced with that of someone dangerous at first and later purely evil. The boys begin to say they are part of a French criminal gang whose boss is Jacques Berenguer, who ordered them to kidnap the girls and will soon be arriving at the villa himself. They wave a gun about, they threaten them, they become physically violent. It's not long before the girls are in tears, begging, praying, but the boys only find this entertaining. At one point, they lock the girls in a bathroom, and it's now that Gianni Guido goes back to Rome to have dinner with his parents. Yes, he had promised mum and dad that he would be home in time for supper, because he was such a good lad, right? He returns to the villa later in the evening. So, this is where I'm going to become a little more explicit about what went on, which I'm sure you can already imagine. I won't go into too much detail because I don't think it's necessary. But in case this kind of thing triggers you, please skip the next 30 seconds. So the boys start beating the girls up, kicking them, punching them. Angelo Izzo repeatedly tries to sexually assault both of them, but he doesn't succeed due to some sort of physical impediment. It was later disclosed he was impotent. Gianni Guido sexually assaults Rosaria. They hit the girls with metal bars, with the butt of their guns, with sticks. They literally torture them. All the while, they are doing drugs, laughing, having fun. The girls are locked in the windowless bathroom all night. They get dragged out together or alone and then thrown back in. The torture goes on the following day. In the afternoon, Andrea Gira, whose family owns the villa, turns up, except he says he's Jacques Berenguer, the leader of the French criminal gang. Gira took Rosaria by the hand and led her to one of the bedrooms, Donatella Colasanti later revealed. She stayed with the other two, who went on beating her up. She didn't get raped, she says, because Angelo Izzo wasn't able to, as we mentioned, and Gianni Guido didn't fancy her. While the boys went on doing different kinds of drugs, Donatella was able to sneak to a phone in the house and call the emergency number. She only managed to say, they're killing me, I'm in a villa in Lavinio, except as we all well know by now, she wasn't in Lavinio, but in Circeo. However, she was barely in time to finish this sentence when she was hit across the back of the head with a metal bar and lost consciousness. 
When she came to, she says that Rosaria was still being kept in the bathroom by Angelo Izzo, with the other two going back and forth to help him. She could hear her friend crying intermittently, as if her head were being dunked in water, which sadly was exactly what was happening and what eventually led to Rosaria Lopez's death at age 19. Donatella gets kicked and bashed about all day. At one point, the men take out syringes containing red liquid, saying that they are going to put her to sleep, but it doesn't work. The torture continues. Donatella drifts in and out of consciousness, and at one point, she hears one of the guys saying, this one just doesn't want to die. It's at that point she realises there is only one way she might get out of this alive, and that is to fake death. Now I want to take a moment here just to celebrate the strength of this woman, her physical strength. These men tried to strangle her. They literally put her through the worst ordeal, but she kept on bouncing back, fighting to not let them subdue her, fighting to stay alive. Her strength of spirit, never giving up till the end, even though one can only imagine how utterly terrifying the situation must have been. To have the courage to try and make that phone call, to have the presence of mind to fake death, which must have been really hard to do considering she had no idea what was coming next, what they might have tried to do to dispose of the evidence of her body. I just think she was such an incredible woman and at such a young age, barely more than a child. Now let's go back to her timeline. Rosaria Lopez has been silent for now some time. Donatella doesn't think. She can't think. She's in pure survival mode, so she has to switch off that part of her brain. Donatella Colasanti is playing dead. It's 9pm of the 29th of September, so the girls have been put through well over 24 hours of torture. The boys are tired of playing this game. You can't see the inverted commas, but they're there. And they decide it's time to head back to Rome. So they drag the two limp bodies to the white Fiat 127 and shove them into the trunk, ready to take them back to the city and eventually find somewhere to dump them. During the drive back to Rome, the boys joke and laugh. From the trunk, Rosaria can hear Angelo Izzo say, aren't these two sleeping well? But in spite of the fact that there are supposedly two dead bodies in the boot of the car, Angelo, Andrea and Gianni are in no rush to cover up their crime, get rid of the corpses, conceal them the best way they can. They don't seem to come to their senses at all. No, they're hungry. So they park their car in Via Pola at 11.30pm and decide to go and grab a bite at the local pizzeria. It is 2.50 in the morning. A woman who lives in Via Pola is awoken by the sounds of banging and shouting. More or less at the same time, a security patrol hears the same sounds and calls the carabinieri which are the Italian military police. The carabinieri advise the headquarters with the following message. Cigno, cigno, c'è un gatto che miagola dentro una 127 in Via Pola, which literally translates as swan, swan, there's a meowling cat in 127 in Via Pola. Swan being the code name of the carabinieri's patrol car. Someone else hears that message, a reporter, Antonio Monteforte. I'm not sure about the dynamics here. Maybe reporters get tip-offs from the police. They certainly did in the past. I'm not sure about now. However, when the carabinieri finally pry open the boot of the white 127, the reporter is there with his flash, ready to shoot one of the most disturbing photos in Italian criminal history. That of Donatella Colasanti, her face absolutely caked in blood, reaching out of the trunk. Though it is not visible in this photo, Rosaria Lopez's dead body is also in the trunk next to Donatella. Donatella is desperate. She's in shock, but she's alive. Next to her in a plastic bag is Rosaria's corpse. The carabinieri only need to check the documents in the car to trace it back to Gianni Guido and very soon to Angelo Izzo and Andrea Ghira, the shortest investigation in the history of police. Donatella is taken to the hospital. She has several injuries as well as a broken nose. But above all, the psychological effect of her ordeal will stay with her for the rest of her life. Some say leading to a premature death due to breast cancer at age 47. However, Donatella didn't allow the pain to silence her request for justice, which she fought for till her last day. Because as you'll soon see, these three despicable men's connections and money help them in many ways. This sounds like one of those dark fairy tales used to warn little girls against the dangers of the world. Little Red Riding Hood, Hansel and Gretel. Stories in which, however, in the end, good always triumphs over evil. But this is not the case here. Almost immediately, surely because he received a tip-off from someone, Andrea Ghira disappears into thin air. 
The following morning, the Carabinieri find his mother and brother at the Villa in Circeo. Probably he had told them about what had happened, or at the very least, asked them to go there and have the place cleaned up to get rid of evidence. According to some sources, the police were able to intercept a letter that was meant for Angelo Izzo and Gianni Guido, who in the meanwhile had been arrested, saying not to worry, that they'd soon be released on good behaviour, and that if Donatella dared to testify against them, he'd have her killed. With the help of his connections, Andrea Aguirre most likely fled to South America, just like the Nazis did only three decades before him. Later in the 80s, he is spotted in Kenya in a luxurious villa. He goes by the name of Lorenzo. The police find out, but Gira manages to flee before they get to him. According to another version, Gira at some point enrolls in the Spanish Legion under the name Massimo Testa and eventually dies in 1994 due to a heroin overdose at the age of 40. All their lives, Donatella and Rosaria's sister Letizia don't believe this for one second. How convenient to die at 40 and not have to face the consequences of his actions. In 2005, his supposed body is exhumed and a DNA test is carried out, which confirms this is Andrea Aguirre. But still many believe that he's still alive and yet again his money paid for his freedom and that the DNA test results were forged. I think at this point we will never know for sure. But let's have a look at the other two gentlemen. So Aguirre never gets caught and will never pay for his crimes, as he is now supposedly dead, no one is looking for him anymore. On the 27th of October 1980, Itzo is sentenced to life in jail, while Gianni Guido gets 30 years. In 1981, Gianni Guido manages to flee. He is caught in Argentina. He flees again, but he's finally arrested in Panama in 1994. Brought back to the Roman jail of Rebibbia, he has officially been a free man since April 11th, 2008. Angelo Itzo's story, however, is the most absurd and ridiculous of them all. After a failed attempt to run away from prison, he tries a new strategy and starts claiming he has knowledge about several other Italian crimes, huge dreadful cases connected to terrorism, like the massacre of Piazza Fontana, an attack on a bank in the centre of Milan in December 1969 that killed 17 people and injured over 80. The massacre of Bologna in 1980 at the railway station in Bologna, which killed 85 people, Crimes connected to the so-called Red Brigades between the 70s and 80s. He also claimed he could collaborate with the police on the resolution of other crimes, murders that happened over the years, mafia executions. He says he regrets all his evil actions and that now he just wants to be a better man. Some of his declarations may have contained a grain of truth, but 99.9% of them were blatantly made up. In 1993, he is allowed out of jail for a few hours on a special permit, and this time he gets away. He flees to France, but is caught in Paris a couple of weeks later. He gets sent back to jail, and again he starts playing the role of a man who's truly repented. In 2001, he gives an interview which is published in the Italian paper La Repubblica. I have stopped loving violence thanks to love, he says. I've had to admit that my enemies, the rest of the world, were right. I was a chauvinist who raped women, a rich bastard. I am truly disgusted with myself. And they believed him, again. He becomes a cooperating witness. In the meanwhile, in jail, he befriends a mafia killer, Giovanni Majorano. In 2004, he is let out of jail part-time. Now, forgive my ignorance, but I don't know what it's called in different countries, but you get what I mean. Probably he only had to return to jail at night. However, it is at this time that he starts a relationship with Giovanni Majorano's wife, the mafia boss he'd met in jail. His wife, Maria Carmela, and 14-year-old daughter Valentina are in a witness protection programme and living in a remote area not far from the jail of Campo Basso where Angelo Izzo had more recently been an inmate. Here, Izzo starts trafficking in weapons and drugs. But then, his warped true nature surfaces again. And on the 1st of May 2005, the dead bodies of two women he had been living with, Maria Carmela and her daughter Valentina, are discovered in nylon sacks. Itzo says he killed them because they were oppressive. He is sent back to jail and sentenced to life again. And that's where he still is, writing books about his life, giving interviews, even getting married. And this is the end of the story, though so much more could be said. And it brings out so many feelings but I've been talking long enough and I'll never get this out there if I don't wrap it up. I just want to say 
that I dedicate this video and this painting to the memory of Donatella Colasanti and Rosaria Lopez. Please do let me know in your comments if you know of any Italian cases you'd like me to cover. Also, if you like this video, please give it a thumbs up as it really helps my channel a lot and hit the subscribe button. I'd be super grateful for that. If you want to check out all my artwork in one place, you can find it on Instagram at the handle drawings in a drawer, all in one word. See you next time.